Hello and welcome to the Discovered Uncovered podcast. Join us as we delve into the unique experiences of expats and locals alike as they share their stories and offer valuable insights into the ins and outs of living and working in one of the most dynamic cities in the world. From the hustle and bustle of the corporate world to the thrill of exploring the city's many attractions, we cover it all. So sit back, relax, and let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Discovered and Uncovered podcast. I'm here with my co-host Nathan and today I'd like to welcome our very special guest who is the head of design at the Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank That's right. and my alleged twin brother. He's been, yeah. he's been called a couple of times as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's been, a, it's been a while since we've caught up. So how have things been? Things are amazing. Thank you for asking. Thanks for having me. Oh, the pleasure's ours. The pleasure's ours. You recently um, launched a book as well, right? Yes. Yes, that's a recent development. Can you uh, tell us more about that? Sure. So I'm from Zimbabwe and the language, our native language there is called Shona. Uh, and a lot of Zimbabweans are currently living abroad, right? So there was okay. a mass exodus. Over the past, I'd say 20 years, people have been leaving in droves. So the kids that are growing up overseas, these Zimbabwean kids typically tend to struggle with picking up Shona because they're not immersed in, in Zim culture and the language. Uh, and I face this problem with my own kids. When Mid Journey and ChatGPT and all these AI tools came about, it suddenly became easier for me as a creative to generate content that I could package into a book because that was always the hurdle I couldn't jump over. Like, how do you get the illustrations exactly the way I wanted them? Again, because I'm a creative, I'm very picky with um, the vision that I wanted. Yeah. But Mid Journey made it really easy because I could iterate and iterate until I found the exact style I wanted. I could even specify the style I wanted. So yeah, that's how it came about, book together for kids to be able to discover Shona and the culture around uh, the Shona language. Amazing. So yeah, that was amazing. amazing. Okay, cool. And you can get that online, right? It's already you can get sale. that online. The website is iloveshona.com. Lovely. I'm very happy I picked that domain up for anyone else. <laughs> it's easy to remember. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice one. Cool. Well, um, okay, fantastic. So um, the main sort of um, idea around this sort of podcast then is going to be sort of a Q&A. Hopefully, it's not going to turn out too much like an interview. <laughs> um, sure. But yeah, we'll kick it off anyway. Asher, if you want to sort of kick things off. Yeah, so first question. I wanted to find out what inspired your interest in, in pursuing a career in design in the first place. So I've always been a designer. So the interest, I guess, stems from the minute I was born. Because I was always the kid who used to draw stuff in class uh, and doodle. And when I got home, I made my own comic books. So through and through, I've always been a designer, I suppose. What just changed over the years is the medium. So whether it was uh, arts and crafts at school when I was a kid, to starting to use computers, to now UI UX, it's all just been uh, a journey of creativity that I've never left. Where would you say the most drastic change was there as well? If you, would you say there's, a, there's been like a, um, a, a huge sort of shock to the UA, uh, UX UI sort of industry? But things sort of changed drastically. I think it's it's when digital transformation started happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which was accelerated by COVID. Obviously, a lot of businesses realized if we don't digitize, we die. Um, so I'd say after 2020, we've seen a, quite a large uptick. And you guys on recruitment, you would have probably noticed design as a discipline is, is much more in demand than it might have been a, a while ago. Uh, and because it's tightly coupled to technology, it's now a lot more relevant than it would have been uh, a few years ago as well. For those who don't know, I mean... Some people may have seen your podcast and seen you seen you online as well. You're quite active on LinkedIn, same same as both of us. I get that all the time. Yeah, yeah. I, can, I can I can imagine. <laughs> so, for, but for those who don't know, how many years have you been in the design industry? And just tell us a little bit about your journey so sure. far. After high school, I went into university and studied computer science. I wanted to study something that wasn't tied to my art side because I could do that already. I didn't need someone to teach me the creative side. But I was also very technically adept, so I wanted to learn uh, IT and tech and computers and programming. So I did that and then came back to design and finally found a discipline that mirrored the two. So UI, UX or product design is, is very much, like I said, tightly coupled with the tech you're designing for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So having that background really helps because um, I enjoy both quite equally, actually. Um, so yeah, so that's essentially how I got into product design is when I discovered it as a way for me to both be technical and creative at the same time. Okay, cool. And um, to the sort of designers listening as well, what advice could you offer someone who's looking to gain sort of that next promotion into, into that yeah. next step? 
This is an interesting one because yeah. my answer probably would have been different okay. um, like two months ago. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Very, very <laughs> yeah, because yeah. <laughs> yeah, of AI, right? Ah, so okay, it, okay. it blindsided us, okay. like literally right. blindsided us. So you find a lot of um, juniors that are coming up are in, in pretty much all our different different aspects of product design, like from writing to visual design, etc. It's all being replaced now by tools. Uh, okay. So so yeah, my, my answer would have been different. But now I would say you need to really reconsider your career path if you're starting out and you want to be in a visual, like cause the landscape has changed. Like okay. you can't come in as a junior anymore because all the things that juniors tend to do are now being automated. Uh, me as a design leader, I also want to streamline my costs, right? So I don't want to be hiring interns to churn out stuff that I can uh, automate using pipelines and, and AI. Essentially, these guys need to sort of really learn the tools as well and these AI technologies. Yeah, you need to <clears> pivot, <throat> pivot somehow. There's some careers that are starting to emerge. Okay. If you remember that uh, no, LinkedIn remember, post yeah. about prompt yeah. engineers, um, I would say look to careers that are emerging rather than trying to ride the wave of careers that have been at a crest and are now essentially dying down and, okay. and becoming obsolete. And and, you, and just, just so I'm, I'm clear and for the audience as well, would you say that UI and UX design is becoming obsolete? Do you think that's dying Slowly down? Slowly but surely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Especially like we're saying at the junior level. It's definitely okay. junior to mid, I would say. It's because if you find now, yeah. when uh, typically you're building a team, there's a lot of pressure from whatever organization you're living in to deliver because um, they don't have the budget or luxury of time to execute things slowly because the market changes so much. Yeah. So all my requirements, <clears throat> uh, wherever I've worked as a design leader, have been to hire senior people. As much as I'd love to promote you know, people coming up and, and hire interns, there just isn't any room for that at the moment. So it's very hard for someone starting out to find work as a junior writer or junior designer, because you've got tools that can do that stuff, like I'm so saying. This, okay, so this is where AI is taking our jobs then? I would say so, <laughs> okay, I would say so. Like, That's an interesting perspective. Six months ago when I joined Adeep, um, part of my strategy was to hire a writer, for example. And <laughs> I wrote a post that was a bit controversial <laughs> Yeah. in the sense that I, quickly changed my plan from hiring an a individual person, a writer, to onboarding an AI tool that would do the writing for us instead. And the reason I did this is I realized that having one writer, which is all I had budget for, was going to create a bottleneck in the team because everyone, including um, our stakeholders like marketing, legal, et cetera, they were all go going to rely on this one UI writer because I only had budget for one person. So instead, having a tool allows me to empower each and every designer in my team with a um, production grade tool that allows them to take ownership of not only the experience they're designing, but also the content that's within the experience they're designing. That was it in a nice pivot. When did you implement that tool and how has that been so far? Did, did, did the plan work out? It worked out stupendously. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I use it, my, my entire team uses it. Um, we use two right now. I don't want to plug them, but I'll yeah. just say the names. Yeah. So ChatGPT is really cool for us because um, it goes beyond just writing copy. We, we use it to write code for our design system too. And we have one called Copymatic, mm -hmm. which is essentially a basic text writer that allows you to churn out options for a piece of copy that you want within your designs, right? So we're blessed that our designs are meant to have as little copy as possible To So if you can't explain the concept within the screen uh, into one or two lines, then obviously, you know, you need to relook the experience itself. So we don't need to generate paragraphs and paragraphs. Um, so the tools that we have allow us to tweak the copy that we need to have on a screen uh, in a very scalable way. Like I'm saying, even if I hire 20 designers, there's mm -hmm. never a bottleneck because each designer can generate production ready copy that they then get approved. So so for, for those junior designers listening, mm. they're like, you know, you know what, Batsy, I don't Do want they to still listen. exist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but let's just say they're listening, right? And they're like, you know what, Batsy, I don't want to listen to you. Oh. I want to, to pursue yeah. this career. This, I want to be you. I want to yeah. be there in a suit, being a head of design one day. And I, yeah. I, know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the experience <laughs> on this podcast. What would you say to them? How, how would they push through these new potential complications when it comes to design? I would say find find a way to differentiate yourself. I would say the way I was able to differentiate myself is that technical background. So the fact that I could code and I could design and I loved both uh, allowed me to stand out 
and and I leveraged that capability throughout my career. So design systems is something that I found where I could flex uh, my technical prowess as well because we could in integrate our design projects with code by building pipelines between them. So that's something that's very hard to pick up if you don't understand like basic like programming, right? Uh, as a designer, which I, I'm not saying every designer should code, but okay, I'm just saying yeah. if you're a junior, find ways to differentiate yourselves. And one of those could be being becoming uh, incredible at prompts because uh, we were trying to use ChatGPT uh, a couple of <laughs> weeks ago for our design system mm -hmm. to write documentation. And the smallest word change could greatly impact the results the language model gave you. So I would say starting to understand the nuances of how do you actually use AI in your day-to-day -day work to elevate your craft might be one way you can differentiate yourself. I'm quite new to the sort of design world. How much of a design sort of, um, how much of the sort of responsibilities in a design role yeah. is on sort of coding on the sort of um, UX front? How much of, would you say, of your sort of daily responsibilities? So not much. Uh, essentially, we're supposed to treat engineering and design as one team. Okay. So the more you collaborate, the better. Yeah. Um, to cover that gap of if your designers don't know the technical implementation of what they're designing, then they need to bounce that off someone who does. Otherwise, you're going to design a journey that's either not feasible, not only from a front end point of view, but a back end point of view. So your core system needs to support whatever your whatever yeah. ideas you have, right, as a foreign experience. So if you don't have it, then collaborate with the engineering team to to fill that gap. I'd say. Okay. Amazing. Um, and I've got another question here for you, which is, yep. which might throw you off because it's a big one. So can you actually share with us a design project that presented unique challenges yep. um, and describe the methods that you employed to sort of achieve um, that sort of successful outcome? I guess I would pick something in my portfolio. Okay. Because I've, I've cherry picked those and pretty much everything in my portfolio, um, save for one project has been personal projects because I find that's where I, I enjoy uh, my work a lot more when I'm doing it for myself and trying to solve a problem that I've identified uh, myself. One of them was when we started, my wife and I, when we started getting into real estate, we wanted something that um, enabled us to manage the properties we were getting. Okay. And there was nothing on the market that was simple, right? Because right. a lot of these platforms were really like monolithic. They were for people with large portfolios or... Um, people that wanted to manage their property end to end, okay. right? So from finding a tenant to getting your maintenance done to collecting rent every month online. Like, so it was quite extensive, but all we needed was just a, almost like a vanity platform where we just log in, see what our portfolio is like with pictures that you can scroll through and just uh, your tenant. So we nice wanted and something very simple Yeah, yeah. and nothing existed. So my brother's an engineer and because I was front end uh, development and design, we collaborated to build a tool. Okay. Um, so what was amazing about that um, was we were able to create our own way of doing things, our own way of working, where we didn't rely on design per se, but we designed in code, designed and coded at the same time. So we could iterate all our designs in code without having to use like Figma or Sketch or anything like that as as a wireframing tool or a design tool. Um, I think that for me, that was quite amazing because uh, because I'm the designer and the front-end developer, I, if I just imagine a screen, it's in my head and I don't have to put it down on paper or on Figma, right? I can yeah. just jump into code and create what I've imagined, uh, test it and then iterate and, and keep going. So yeah, we, we found that really amazing and we actually ran tests with real people that had real estate. Um, they used the platform again, because we're doing everything in code, we could actually run our uh, usability testing with our actual built uh, product instead of running usability testing using a prototype yeah. and then trying to build it. So that was really, really fun. We did that in, in 2020 during uh, lockdown. So we had a lot of time. And I would say that's, that's probably one of my favorite projects I've done because I was doing the design and the code simultaneously as well is that a project that still exists to this day yeah, it is that's what i was about to ask <laughs> it, is. Yeah. it is okay uh it's called zimba.com zimba is a shorter word that means house okay i'll have to have a look at that dzymba.com nice well um yeah that's very interesting and i think that's that's a cool story for the listeners as well um mm -hmm. who are potentially looking to to achieve sort of maybe yeah. even their own little startup or something like that yeah, as well. yeah and and like i said a lot of my portfolio work is my personal work so yeah. another thing I'd say to juniors is find 
something that you're passionate about and design for it. Okay. And usually those start to, uh, you can start to build a much better portfolio than waiting for the work you're doing at work. Because as a junior, you're not going to get like exciting work starting out. Yeah. So you have to really take ownership of, of the quality of work that you put out by doing stuff on your own. Okay. And here's a question that was actually, so, so I, I think a post I did recently, I asked what questions would they like to ask you? So here's one. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah, there, well, there, was, there was one person who commented, um, so it wasn't as popular as I, as I, as I was hoping <laughs> in the honesty. Just the one. <laughs> yeah, it's just one comment. But I will ask the question, so that will, that will get answered. Nice. And it, and it kind of transition, transitions on from what you were just saying. So tips on transitioning from a graphics designer to a UI designer. Or UI, UI UX, product designer. Wow. Yeah, so I actually I guess it's a good question because I did it. I was initially a graphic designer, then I switched. I would say finding a profound respect for technology and passion for technology would be what underpins that transition. Because graphic design traditionally, you're, you're typically not really designing for tech, right? So as a graphic designer, you, you're mostly doing stuff like print, maybe online uh, advertising banners and things like that, but it's mostly print related mm -hmm. traditionally as graphic design. Um, so if you want to switch to, to designing exclusively for tech, then you need to put aside all the little bad habits that you had as a graphic designer and start to relearn what it means to design on a digital platform. Um, so that, that's where things like inclusion, accessibility come in, right? As a baseline, if you're designing for tech, you need to respect that it's being used by people from every sensibility, every culture, any and every um, uh, disability, for example. So yeah, I would say respect the, the platform, understand the platform and pivot your way of thinking from being physical to being digital. Okay, so just around that, so being sort of very tech related, do you ever find that um, designers come in, find their place in sort of a UX UI role and then work their way into maybe a, an actual tech sort of software engineering role potentially do you ever find these people transition into maybe like a front end um sort of role? yeah is yeah that, is that common or yeah it happens uh not as not common obviously because um development is very it's a very specialized skill set yeah yeah definitely um and you find Probably a lot of people game. that go into design will say i hate maths or <laughs> you know they'll say things like that okay and Different coding it's, it's all mathematics so yeah, it's very few. There's one, uh, probably my famous one, my, my favorite one is Jan Six. Okay. Um, he created the Figma tokens plugin. Shout out to Jan Six. Um, it's, well, it's now actually called Token Studio. But he's, he's, gen he's essentially a designer that codes and okay. he codes really well. Um, and you find a lot of the designers that code are essentially self-taught. Um, right. Yeah, but they're, they're very rare. Okay. Interesting. Oh, it interested. does happen. How good would you say your code is? Depends what I'm coding. So yeah. because I haven't done it as a profession mm -hmm. for like 20 years, I am not a good developer. Uh, but I know enough to to build things that work. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll put <laughs> it like that. So it's a, it's a good answer. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. And now with ChatGPT yeah. helping me, I okay. I'm just above average as a developer now. Um, cause now I'm like, like I said, for our design system, I'm building all the custom transforms we have in JavaScript. I'm doing that together with chat, chat GPT because without it, I wouldn't have been able to do it. Okay. I, I find it very interesting. The amount you use uh, chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a game changer. Yeah, cause yeah. I'm all over it. It's, it's such a recent change. Yeah. So it's not something we probably ask enough. Yeah. I yeah. Think. That's why like yeah. pivoting is important. Like as tech comes out, you need to be able to pivot. Otherwise you get left behind very quickly. Have you used the um, chat GPT, I think it's the, the four? Yeah, four. GPT-4. I, I think GPT-4 is only available if you're paying for it. Yeah. 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 So yeah. no. I that's the next yeah. level again, isn't it? I think yeah. that's yeah. with like imagery and stuff like that yeah. as well. So I'm using two separate tools. So chat GPT, I only use it for language. Yeah. Then imagery, I use mid journey. Mid journey. Yeah. Is that similar to a chat GPT-4, is it? Yes. Okay. For images. Because mid journey is specifically for uh, generative uh, images. Okay. Yep. Amazing. I've been thinking about playing around with something like that for my edits. For your photoshops? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah you should. Because what you can do is provide a seed of yourself, um, like a URL to an image of you. Okay. And then tell Midjourney to generate different scenarios 
using that seed with like a prompt yeah. as well that would, exactly okay. so you've, you've just yeah. unlocked a whole kind of world <laughs> it's gonna it's gonna be an interesting next yeah, few months yeah. everybody get ready and what's <laughs> incredible is it can generate photorealistic um images right so you've seen all those uh fakes of the pope and trump yeah yeah right? yeah, yeah, so yeah yeah those is that, is that using that. Mid -journey, journey, is it? yeah it's all oh, mid journey. Wow. okay oh. Interesting. It's going to be an interesting next few months. Everybody buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to start editing. So what skills and qualities, and I know you touched on it a little bit there. Yeah. But especially when it comes to interviews, because that's what we help people do, of course. Right, so right. So from an interview, so let's say someone's interviewing uh, with you. Yeah. What kind, What do you want to hear from them? What essential skills do they, because in order for them to be concise, uh, what skills do you want to hear? So there's two things, Some the stuff that I want to hear and then the stuff that I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll start with your question about stuff that I would like to hear. So I'd like to hear that you're keeping up with tech, right? You're yeah. tinkering with um, things that are unconventional, that you are active, I would say. You don't have to be like us, right? Where you're podcasting and all that, mm -hmm. but I would like to see that you are at least active in some okay. community okay. somewhere, okay. Uh, because that's what I expect of my own team. So if you're joining the team, then you know, you have to, to, to be at, you have to, to, to be with that uh, program, right? Get with yeah. that program. Um, cause the way I've, I've seen it now being active, um, does a lot for your own self-confidence as a designer. And it does a lot to build up your, uh, communication as well with the stakeholders at work. Yeah. Um, and if you are active, it also means you need to know what you're talking about. Um, right. So it, it also keeps you up to date with your craft, but it also allows you to take criticism online, which then uh, builds up uh, a way for you to argue your point or to lose that sensitive twitch that you might have when people criticize something you say or something you do at work. So it, it really helps to build you as an all round designer. I've, I've found um, personally from when I started being active on social, I've seen those are some of the things that, that have helped me um, and that have improved. And yeah. some of the things that I, that I uh, look for is how you communicate. Um, are you excited when you talk about design? How active are you when it comes to solving problems? Uh, one of the questions that I typically ask is, tell me a problem you recently solved and how you, you solved it. Um, you find people that are wallflowers at work typically can't really answer that question with conviction because they weren't involved in the actual problem solving. They might have been like downstream with the execution, but the nitty gritties of why and how that problem was solved typically don't come out uh, clearly. So yeah, that's, that's uh, some of the things I look for. I think going back to your point where people are doing these sort of extracurricular activities, let's yeah. say, I think that really shows their interest and op optimism exactly. into the sort of opportunity and learning to grow as well. So I think yeah. that's definitely a huge Yeah, factor. absolutely. And, and that's, I found that um, that hunger is infectious in the team. Yeah. So having people in your team with that hunger then permeates throughout not just your design team, but the whole business as well. Yeah. Because um, even now at work, people in the corridors will say, oh, you're on LinkedIn, you've inspired me. I also want to write a book or, you know, I also want to be more active on LinkedIn and, you know, I'm seeing you do it and I think I can do it too. So you, you, it, it goes beyond the, our team because everyone that's saying that to me now is either on the business side of the bank or on the engineering side of the bank. And um, sort of integrating with the whole interview aspect. Yeah. So um, another sort of good question to ask. So what are your thoughts on a design task as part of the interview oh, yeah. process? So yeah. we find um, sort of as recruiters, we, we have to explain the sort of interview, interview yeah. process with our candidates. Sometimes in the engineering world, these guys don't want to do engineering tasks. And then right. the design world, similar thing comes up yeah. again. Yeah. Now, what are your thoughts around that? How essential do you think it is? And yeah. Yeah, good question. Mm -hmm. I think it is essential. Yeah. Um, what's, what I would say, though, is how you conduct the test um, needs to be a little bit different to how it's currently done. So typically now you would receive the test on through email, right? And you're given a certain time frame to complete it. Yeah. Um, I don't believe that works simply because throughout my career, people have come to me for help on their tasks. Yeah. Um, right. So I know that these tasks aren't necessarily being done 100% by the candidate. Okay. Right. So for me, it's not a good measurement of their skill set. 
Also, because if you give them a couple of days, two, three, four days to do something, typically at work in our agile environments, you don't have that much luxury of time to, to research and do all, all this stuff, right? Yeah. So I would actually prefer a whiteboard session where I simply ask you to do something in real time. I see, okay. Then I see how you think and how you communicate, how you ask me questions about the task and how you go about solving a problem uh, yeah. on the spot. I've found that is probably a more accurate way to to gauge someone's level of seniority and their passion and and the level of craft they have for for whatever task, whether it's engineering or or design. Okay, and and around that again, so something that will probably integrate nicely into my next question. So, what are your thoughts around um, portfolios as well, and how important is that? Whether that's even yeah. through the application process, where um, you know you don't really know much about the candidate at the point. Yeah. Um, how important is this and um, how much sort of time and sort of effort should people spend into developing that portfolio? Yeah, so I, I would say portfolio is is crucial, I would say. Um, so even if it's, let's say, for example, you completely plagiarize and you just Google search, put some, uh, just grab some images off the internet and call it your portfolio. Even that, being able to curate work that looks amazing tells me that you've got an eye for amazing design. Yeah. Right. So if you're curating work off the Internet and calling it your own, even when it's not, and you're picking crap designs with like uh, bad design principles and whatever, uh, even though I don't know it's your they're not yours, I can still tell that you're not a great designer. Yeah. Um, right. So you can see at that base level where at that extreme where the portfolio isn't yours, you can still tell something about someone. Yeah. But you definitely want that sort of backup and sort of reasoning behind your sort of portfolio and stuff like that as well yeah yeah so that that brings back to how much time and effort the designer needs to put so typically if you so we're, we're in user-centered design right so what i've seen uh mentors online tell people is put yourself in the other person's shoes when you're building your portfolio yeah like for example you guys go through hundreds of cvs every month if not thousands. Oh, yeah. yeah. You don't have Everybody. time the to look at. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, exactly, right? You don't crazy. have time to look at three or four portfolios on one person's uh, portfolio website, right? Yeah, I agree, yeah. So it's more about the quality than the quantity. Yeah. So how much effort should you put? I would say focus on one or two really, really great case studies where if I like, good example is now when I was hiring for senior designers, uh, my go-to document was their CV because it told me a story of how much effort did this person put in their CV? What experience do they have? If they're a designer, are they pixel perfect in their CV or not? How is their choice of typography? How is the uh, layout of, of the CV? So I can already tell your CV is almost like its own portfolio piece. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, especially for in the design industry. Um, I, I consider my CV as a portfolio piece because it tells volumes of how much I care about every pixel that I design. Amazing. Um, okay. So once I look at your CV, if I um, get past that hurdle and I'm happy, I go to your portfolio page and I literally look at it for like five seconds because I'm just looking for for red flags Yeah. more than trying to evaluate you based on the portfolio because yeah. I don't really know if everything you're saying on that thing is accurate sure. or not. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all I want to do is get to a place where I'm comfortable that you're you're putting yourself out to the world as a decent designer from your CV and portfolio. So it's worth a conversation where I now try to dig deep into whether what I've seen is true or not. Yeah, it tells a bit more of a story around your yeah. sort of um, ideology as well around the yeah, sort of design yeah. world. Yeah. And I, I don't give design tasks. I'm 100% I'm yeah, well, against that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I actually like that whiteboard idea. I think it's much better. I have someone doing a, a design task now. I have a whole week to do it. Oh, it's no. A bank. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just don't think like... it's the best way to do things. <laughs> no, it's not. All. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Like yeah. you as the hiring person or manager, you've wasted a week where you could have closed down. Exactly, yeah. From, from a recruitment standpoint, yeah. it's a, a whole week you've wasted for a design task that might not even be good. Then you have to go yeah. back to the drawing board. How yeah. critical is your project? Yeah. And if it's critical, then a week of time is very yeah. long. And then you have to wait for us to get you some new profiles. And that's going to take... Yeah. So portfolio there is key, isn't it? Yeah. 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 So when I was interviewing for the role I'm in now as head of design at Adib, um, they gave me a whiteboard session, not a task. Okay. Yeah. I prefer that. And ready, ready see that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was... I think what helped is they were able to... Because what they were looking for specifically is um, someone who thinks a certain way. Yeah. 
and someone who brings ideas on the table that people that they already had were not bringing, right? So they gave me a real life problem that the teams were needed to fit, to to solve, like a UX problem. Mm-hmm. And if I had solved it in the same way that every other person had solved it, then I would they would see that I can't provide any value, right? Yeah, so, yeah. definitely. And and you, you don't have a week to come up with ideas when yeah. you're trying to solve a, a real life uh, you know, crisis in in the bank, right? Using ChatGPT to figure out figure out new ideas. Exactly yeah. in that week. <laughs> yeah. in, in that week, start studying, help yeah. Yeah. changing, board, changing different words. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Out of interest, oh, I'm not sure if you can say this on the podcast. Yeah. It's up to you. Uh, who, who, what was the job position of the person interviewing you? Were they a designer or did they? No, none of them were design? designers. Okay, interesting. Yeah, they were all either product or engineering. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So expanding on that sort of previous question then, um, and this is a little bit more around sort of gaining industry exposure. Um, so what constitutes an outstanding profile for design for a design candidate, uh, including the likes of their LinkedIn? Yeah. We've already kind of covered sort of CV and, and portfolio, but any yeah. any sort of additional aspects that they could add to um, their sort of social media platforms, like you sort of LinkedIn and so on, how can they gain more exposure? Oh, yeah, this is a tough one. Simply because there are some amazing people that don't tick some of the boxes yeah, I was going to say. True, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's a tough one. You don't really know. Okay, so if your question is what constitutes an outstanding profile, like one percenter of people, I would say... Yeah. It's 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 what what how can they how can they go about changing their let's okay. say for example you've got a candidate here they're struggling to get in front of these people and yeah. get noticed essentially in the yeah. industry yeah what can what sort of ideas or advice could you give them to help gain that sort of industry exposure you know sort of potentially sort of attending these events or posting on LinkedIn or yeah. these kind of sort of aspects yeah I would say LinkedIn is your is your most powerful tool in that regard. Okay. Because everyone is hiring on LinkedIn now. Yeah. Um, as a professional, you cannot ignore LinkedIn and you, you can't ignore the power of LinkedIn. It's um, crazy. I think my, the past four roles I've had, I didn't even have to apply for because people would read out, reach out to me, which which comes back to that whole exposure point you, you yeah, mentioned. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, so if LinkedIn is your most powerful tool, there are a few things that you can do to optimize your LinkedIn profile. Yeah. Um, so these are things that you hear every day. Just work on your description with keywords. Uh, have a great fo- uh, photo. If you consider yourself a creative, then don't wear a suit and tie, you know, and try to Definitely, portray yeah. the LinkedIn image. Just be yeah. yourself. Yeah. Right? I've seen uh, creatives with a LinkedIn profile uh, picture where it's the back of their head, right? And and that tells me that this person is interesting, right? They think different. Okay. And they're willing to do things that are, they're willing to be themselves. Um, as And, and I think that only works yeah. for creators. Uh, obviously, an, an accountant yeah. with a Sales profile picture account. where yeah, yeah. Just wouldn't it wouldn't work. make sense. No. But because you're in, in a field that allows you to think different and to be different, um, to put it in Apple's term, to think different, um, then yeah, I would say just be yourself and p- portray yourself in a way that's slightly different to everyone else would. But also like if we're, if we're saying, talking about being outstanding, I would say, yeah, yeah definitely contribute and create content. Um, Cause nothing beats someone who's able to create content in their domain. Cause then you're perceived as, uh, as a master of your domain. Yeah. And it's efficiency as well. And it's uh, staying consistent um yes with this you know, yes absolutely good things don't come in short very short absolutely. periods do this yeah so. and consistency could just be like one post a week yeah start somewhere we've spoken a lot about junior designers and even maybe your mid-level designers so what about the senior designers who with the over that hurdle they've escaped the, the ai burdens right and now they want to get to where you're at they want to step up and get to their director the leads the head of because yes. uh, very recently you've you've probably made quite a few jump, uh, sort of career jumps and promotions within the last what five years? Two years. Yeah, two years. Yeah, two years, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Two years so. ago, I was just a designer. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Oh, two yeah. years ago. Jeez. Two okay. years ago. Yeah. So that was, so <laughs> <laughs> that was a great question then. Less than two years ago, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great, it's a fantastic question. It's better than I thought. So, so yeah, what advice would you How give did to you them? Do? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I was talking to someone about this recently. Because I was trying to answer the same question. Okay. Like, what was it? So if to answer the question, I'll tell you the story of how I first transitioned into design leadership. A company was looking to hire a head of design. 
and they approached someone who was already ahead of design, right? So, because that's where you usually start. Mm -hmm. That person wasn't interested in, in switching jobs, but they said, hey, I've worked with this kid. Why don't you try uh, reaching out to him? They reached out to me, I interviewed, and then I got the job, right? Um, so then the question I was asking myself is, this design leader has worked with countless designers in their tenure as a design leader. Why did they pick me? Because it, by then I was just a senior or a lead designer, right? Why did they pick me out of the myriad of designers they had or they'd worked with before? Like, what was it about me that made them pick mm -hmm. me and made them comfortable to put my name um, forward for a head of design position when I wasn't a head of design? Because that's also a reputational risk, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah 100%. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think I, looking back to my time with, with uh, that design leader, I realized that I was doing a lot of things that were not design related, but were more strategic thinking type of things and were interdepartmental uh, type of things. So a lot of, uh, I was coming up with a lot of initiatives, for example, to integrate, uh, well, I, I would be lying if I said a lot. I was, I came up with one. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Uh, let's start there. Truth comes up. <laughs> <laughs> let's start there. Yeah. So one initiative was to try and see how our risk department used some of the data models that our data scientists were building in the digital lab to, this came about after COVID, right? When a lot of banks needed bailouts because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I was trying to think, how do we build data models that allow the bank to anticipate uh, these natural, nat I wouldn't say natural disaster, but more like, more like pandemic type um, things that you can't predict. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, so I, I linked our data team up with risk and started to have discussions with them, um, started to research, um, some uh, white papers that were written like academic papers around this topic. Um, so that was one, um, one thing. The other thing was trying to, to leverage what had happened in COVID for the benefit of the business. So which trying to see which groups have been affected. And because we're in digital, how can we use digital to empower those groups um, that are now dis disenfranchised because the entire world's shut down? So another business unit, a completely new business unit, sprouted up because of that uh, idea I had, because I, I presented an idea and the uh, chief digital officer loved it. And we actually ended up assigning people and myself being the designer we had engineers and business analysts and stuff working on that project as a full, full blown um, vertical within the bank, uh, right? And that had nothing to do with design. I was just trying to see how can I add value above and beyond what I do as a designer. So those I think are the things that as a design leader, you're expected to do. Yeah. Um, you, I, I'm not the one who's expected to be designing at Figma anymore, right? They're hiring me to go above and beyond that, to understand where the bank is going or where your organization is going, what the, your organization's long-term, short-term, mid-term goals are, and trying to find ways of using digital to enable those goals. Um, so yeah, that has nothing to do with design, but as a thought leader and design leader, that's what you need to be doing. Yeah, it just shows you that going those extra lengths Oh yeah, um, and the sort of power of word of mouth as well. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like I said, I haven't applied for a job in so long because it's all been word of mouth. Uh, maybe because, like like you're saying, if you're active online, yeah, you're always top 100%. of mind. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. With people as well. So yeah, it's it's a it's a lot of things you need to do to to level up, but it's doable. We like that, and this is a question I'm quite interested to ask you. Oh, okay. So it's, <laughs> not, it's nothing too personal. We We're supposed to be like <laughs> twins, so you should know. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. So. What do you think of design in this region? Because in my experience, and I, for those who don't know, so I recruited product designers. All well, I've mostly done in my life is recruiting yeah. product designers. Yeah. And in London, it's a little bit different to here. Whereas the companies here, I find, don't always understand and value design itself. Okay. Um, and I feel like a lot of companies, for example, they'll just hire a product designer. They expect that product designers to do everything from UI, mm. UI design to interactive design to visual design into service design to shoe cleaning to dolphin training to user research etc cetera, etc cetera. and and it just seems to be quite a general role whereas in england you see 
specific roles for UI design, UX right. design, interactive design, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, so what are your thoughts on design here? And why, why do you think if there is that difference? And if you've, seen, if you've seen the same thing, I'm not sure. So I'm not sure I've seen that actually. Okay, Maybe okay. because I've only worked at large organizations. Um, and typically those larger organizations tend to attract talent from all over the place. Um, and it really is talent. So I've learned a lot just from working at the banks in the region. Mm -hmm. Uh, my level of craft has like exponentially risen because okay. I've been around extremely talented people. Um, so from that perspective, my view of design in the region is is that it actually tends to be superior to like Britain and uh, Europe, et cetera, in America, okay, okay. Uh, simply because we are attracting talent from those places, and it's not just anyone; it's the best, uh, the best talent. And now as I've started to see actually a lot more head of design roles uh, coming up. And typically what that tells me is the business realizes that they, they cannot tell great design from mediocre design, right? They need someone who's been in the trenches in order to build up that capability within the organization. So like you're saying, um, there, there's a lot more respect now, I would say, for design because that tends to be your differentiator as a digital company, all right, is how good is your experience? You tend to gain market share or lose customers um, by your, you know, by the experience you have on your digital platform, whether you're a bank, an e-commerce platform, or whatever you are. So I would actually say, in my experience, okay. design in the region is amazing because simply because I am where I am, uh, because I've rubbed shoulders with designers from Europe, America. Um, and obviously like um, people that within the GCC region as well that have all molded me to become what I am now. So I have really high, uh, I have a really high regard for design in the region. Okay. And is, and is that, have you rubbed those shoulders mostly within the companies you've worked in? Or yes, is that else, correct. Have you, okay. Yes. Okay. okay, cool. Any more questions from yourself? I think that's all the, uh, design questions that I have <laughs> sort of working in the uh, development space anyway. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Cool. Well, one of the last questions, which is kind of not really a question I can ask too much anymore, was going to be a closing statement from yourself. Yeah. And there was going to be one message to give to a junior designer, designer listening. <laughs> Just to to pick something else. You know what? If a junior designer <laughs> yeah. has listened this far. Yeah. <laughs> they, they can persevere. <laughs> then yeah. they can get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go get her then they can make it. So the message I would have is to the junior designers that are not listening. Yeah. <laughs> so wherever you are, if you have friends that are not listening, um, let them know to get online and start being active. Yeah. Um, start to find a way to differentiate yourself online. Because when, when I'm hiring, that's what I look for. I just look for people that are online. So if you're not online, how am I going to find you? Or if you are online and your presence is mediocre at best, I'm not going to want you in my team. Another question. Are you hiring? Unfortunately not. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay. So we, like I said, we, we were only trying to hire seniors because that's okay. what we had capacity for. And we closed up our two UX designers. Okay. We managed to grab someone from South Africa and someone, a British guy who was already in the region. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm saying we get talent from around the world. Okay. And if someone was to try and grab your attention for future purposes, if you're mm. ever hiring in the future, how yeah. would you advise them to go about that? Actually, you might not want to answer that question because you might have five, <laughs> 500 messages. Five I already get yeah. them anyway. <laughs> so yeah. it's not going to hurt. What's the most outgoing thing that you've seen that's really thought made you think, okay, this guy's good. Tricky. Question. I think it's people that have invited me to speak on their platforms. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Like, th because those, those people are trying to make a name for themselves and they're trying to put out content that helps other people. Um, so those, are, I think those are the designers that, that I remember. Okay. Um, so if we wanted say. to be designers, we're in with a chance. Then. Yeah, yeah, you are. I mean, <laughs> I, definitely I'm not, basically yeah, not, not actually. <laughs> no, <laughs> there's enough, there's enough Matsis in the world. Yeah. yeah I don't it. need another Matsi. I just need a seat now. <laughs> yeah. I think mean, that's a good question for, for us to answer as well. I'm sure people would be interested because we definitely do get a, a yeah, few. Yeah, a few, I was going to um, ask you guys as recruiters, like, yeah. how has, how has it been for you? 
Yeah, good. Um, the, we get asked on a daily basis. Um, I think my inbox gets flooded with hundreds mm. of messages on the wow. daily. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's difficult to answer um, answer everyone. Um, but one core question that we get asked the most is, I'm applying for these jobs. I'm not gaining yeah. any interest. Yes. Yeah. Um, and how do I go about sort of getting in front of these people? And yeah. now, of course, coming to recruiters, yeah, that's one way. But um, you know, sometimes we don't have these connections, and we don't, we're not working with these people. To do it yourself, I think one piece of advice is do what other people aren't doing. You know, exactly. ask yourself, you want to work for, for for this tech company? Have you tried calling them? The answer is you probably haven't. You know, we will. Ha I'll post a job advert, and um, you know, out here in the UAE, it's crazy. So. Back in the UK, for example, I'd post a job advert and I'd get about 400 applicants over three weeks, I'd approximately, uh, for, for a standard sort of software development role. I imagine it's probably the same in the sort of design world. Um, here, I get 400 in about 40 minutes. Yeah, it's so insane. Yeah. If you're, From if you're, around the world? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I try to make my search so that it's people just in region. It depends what, it depends what the client is looking for. If the client's looking for people around the world, then yeah, of course, I'll open it up. But if it's, we need somebody in region, then it would have to be a regional spec. Uh, but I'd get that amount in literally a couple of, couple of hours. And if you think that just by putting your CV through that LinkedIn... Easy job, apply. <laughs> yeah, easy apply. That you're going to be that person that gets in front of the, the, the head of design, let's say. You're going to struggle. You need to do... You need to go above and beyond, like like you said, and sort of your inboxes are about to blow up. Yeah, well, <laughs> is it okay. Well, describe yeah, above and beyond. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's 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 contacting you know the hiring managers, trying to reach out with these people, going onto the tech company's profile on LinkedIn, finding out who works there, finding out who's probably going to be the best port of call, connecting and trying reaching out to them directly. Okay, Maybe I'll, not go as far as knocking on their door, but you could yeah, even, you okay, can even try that to an extent. But I, I've got, I've got a question for you then, and maybe I could probably answer it as a recruiter as well. But okay. how do you do that but not come across as needy? Because yeah, we all know, desperate. Yeah, we all know that <laughs> no one likes someone who, who comes across too needy, that, and that can make you seem less valuable. That I would go in with not more of a, I'm looking for a job. Are you hiring? I'd go in with the... I've been looking at your company over the past sort of six months and I've really started to gain an interest in the company. I'm happy where I am at the moment. I understand that it's likely you might be hiring, you might not be, but please can you consider me in the future for any potential positions that you may have? Um, because, and then go into why you want to work for, for that company or what, yeah. what what is it about that specific company that grabs your interest? That actually re reminds me of... Um this piece of content I saw from a South African investor who was talking about all the messages he gets from companies that are looking for investment mm -hmm. and giving people tips on how to approach an investor. Okay. All right. And the tips he gave, I would say, are universal to the discussion we're having now, where he said, look at it from the perspective of a man trying to approach a woman. Right, you need to be very mindful of a few things. Right, so you need to be respectful. You need to uh, just greet her like a human being. Right, not like a. I'm not gonna say. You know, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you need to have a just have a conversation with her where you find out some of the things she looks for, and inadvertently project those qualities. And he gave the example, for example. Um, he asked, so what do you what what do you look for in a guy? They said, oh, you know, my parents, my dad was always uh, in church, so I'm looking for a guy, you know, that's in church or whatever. Um, and then somewhere along in the conversation, you're like, uh, oh yeah, so last week I went to church with my grandma, mm -hmm. and you so so you're not saying you go to church, yeah, but you tell her an okay, anecdote okay. Oh, that my, yeah. incorporates what she's looking for as if it's part of your day to day life. Um, right, so you have to be slick about it. Essentially, is what he's saying. Okay. Yeah. Tailoring uh, your approach. Yeah. Tailor your approach. Yeah. To have maximum impact and hit all those, all those points that the other person deems valuable. So, for example, if you're going to DM me or Usher, or any recruiter, right? If you're going to DM us and your first line is "Hey, mate," 
Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking, and I've had that. Like, yeah, hey, yeah, mate, I'm sure. looking for work. Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. Like, really? I'm not your mate. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, have yeah. have some class, right? Yeah. So approach it in a, in a very strategic way, almost like a cunning way. Yeah. Um, yeah ask me yeah, yeah. questions. Like, how many people have asked you a question when they DM you? Not many, right? So you can ask me a question and then frame yourself to... In, in, so I can start to see you in, in that same light. Yeah. It's it's a very like nuanced dance that you have to do. Yeah, and to expand on that, and this is the advice that we give to all of our candidates, um, you know, if we know who's interviewing at the time and who you're going to be speaking with, definitely take a look through their profile. Yeah, research. Yeah. Yeah. Find out a little bit about them. You know, you can have some interesting talking points yeah. and this is what really, really helps make you stand out from yeah. the others it stops yeah. the whole the whole sort of roboticness in the in the interview process yeah so, yeah. yeah i did that in one of my interviews so uh, i researched the person who was going to be interviewing me and one of the articles they were speaking about how crucial data was and how we need to start leveraging data to provide uh, experiences yeah so i made sure to integrate that aspect like um the fact that i championed data-led design for example, and that, you know, having access to clean data makes mm. us able to build better experiences. Yeah. So I managed to weave that in. Like, okay, so I, I was slick. consciously yeah, yeah. waiting, trying to see what his reaction would be, and he smiled. Okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then I knew. Yeah. Like, see, this, 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 <laughs> I got it. This is the game. Honestly, a lot of this podcast probably <laughs> should have been about this, this sort of stuff, because this is what people need to hear. Yeah. Because, again, we get approached so, so much. Yeah. Uh, especially since, as you know, we're very active on socials. So, Imagine if someone DM'd you a Photoshop picture of themselves. No. <laughs> do, that. do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. 100%. I, want, I just want to see it for mine here. Yeah, like be, yeah. Yeah, be original, be funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's, oh, that's, that's just... a great idea. Why has no one done that? <laughs> to be fair, uh, there's a guy called Tony. Yeah. Um, we can maybe talk about him in, uh, another time, maybe get him on as a guest. But um, he did a Photoshop for me. But that wasn't that wasn't applying for a job. It was just yeah for loss. But you see, yeah. you remember him. Yeah, hundred percent. This like, is the point. Uh, forget, I remember forget, this yeah, one. This is the, the big air balloon thing. Wasn't yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it, was really, it was much better than mine. Mine's mine. design as well. There <laughs> much you go. better than mine. Yeah, that's how it works. So yeah, no, hundred percent. Something unique like that. Now, now you're throwing. You can't do it. Anymore. <laughs> but yeah. in theory, that yeah. would have worked. Something like that would definitely would grab grab attention, especially if it's good. And it's better than mine. Super insightful. Yeah, but. Um, yeah that's a that's a great sort of closing uh statement so um yeah it's been an absolute pleasure having you our first guest so for everybody listening well this is going to be on spotify youtube and linkedin linkedin will just be clips so stay nice. tuned and, and check us out on all of the platforms amazing thank you very much for having me great time nice space yeah it's a, it's a new podcast great. actually yeah podcast studio so shout out it's podcast cool. now thanks for tuning in to another episode of discovered uncovered Join us next time as we delve deeper into the experiences of expats in the Middle East and uncover more about the lifestyle here. Don't forget to share the podcast with your friends and follow us on social media for updates and more. Until next time.